All right, next trivia question. During the case, the patient becomes hypotensive. How should this be treated? Treatment should be directed at correcting the underlying cause and may include the following. So you want to consider decreasing your anesthetic depth. You want to consider giving fluids. You want to consider placing the head or the patient in uh, Trendelenburg, which is head down. You also want to consider giving a vasopressor such as phenylephrine. And if there's no obvious cause, the, the thing that I would recommend the most is just decreasing the depth of anesthesia. Now, keep in mind, the reason why I even put this one in here is because I don't want you to assume that just because the blood pressure is low, that you want to jump straight to vasopressors. That's not always the case. You, and you want to make sure that, again, you're treating the cause and not giving them something that's not necessary when you're causing it by having them, maybe you left your gas up and you forgot about it, for example. Welcome back to Steering School Prep Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell. And today we're going to finish up this vasopressor series and talk about phenylephrine, also commonly referred to as NEO. So let's go ahead and get started. So what is phenylephrine? Phenylephrine is a direct acting sympopathomimetic, which is a selective alpha-1 adrenergic receptor agonist. It's used primarily as a vasoconstrictor to increase blood pressure. However, unlike epinephrine, it primarily acts on the vascular system without significant impact on the heart rate or cardiac output. Due to the receptor density being higher in the, ve in the veins than in the arteries, uh, arterial constriction is, or the venous system is predominant over the arterial beds. So again, venous constriction is predominant over arterial constriction. And therefore it causes an increase in CVP and stroke volume. Importantly, however, this effect is only transient, and over the long run, the increase in venous resistance will decrease your venous return and thus preload. And you also should be aware of that uh, phenylephrine can lead to an increase in afterload with an increase in systemic vasoconstriction. And so because it's just an alpha-1 agonist, it produces the systemic vasoconstriction, and therefore the work of the heart actually increases. And if the coronary circulation is impaired, the decrease in myocardial oxygen supply ratio can actually precipitate angina and has been shown to increase mortality in heart failure patients. So I want to drive this home because this is not a benign drug. I think it's such a commonly used medication in the operating room and it is a great drug and it has a really great purpose. However, you have to be really cognizant on not only why you're choosing to use it as far as you know, do they really need a vasopressor or do they need fluid, but also understand the patient's pathophysiology process, especially if they have some type of coronary disease, knowing that this um, could put the patient to undue harm if used extensively and not um, considering the actual physiological effects of this drug on, on the patient. All right, next we are going to get into the pharmacological action of the drug. So again, classification is an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor agonist. It's primarily used to treat actually nasal congestion, which you probably know as Afrin. Um, it is also used as a vasopressor agent, which is what we talk about mostly today to treat hypotension. It can also be used for pupil dilatation during eye examinations. All right, now let's get into more of the mechanism of action. So the mechanism of action um, is an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor activation Phenylephrine induces vasoconstriction by stimulating this alpha-1 adrenergic receptor on the vascular smooth muscle cells, leading to the increase in blood pressure. It causes vasoconstriction through an increase in peripheral vascular resistance, which elevates blood pressure. And remember, it's in the veins more than the arteries. When we get into the release of metabolism, this uh, medication is as far as source goes, it's given exogenously as far as it's just a medication. It's not a hormone or anything like that. It's a medication that we just give to produce an effect. Um, metabolism, it's metabolized in the liver and intestines via the MAO enzyme um, with its metabolites being excreted in the urine. All right, more on the molecular action. So receptor binding. 
It binds again selectively to the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, causing an increase in intracellular calcium levels in smooth muscles, leading to vasoconstriction. It increases both systolic and diastolic blood pressure by reducing vascular diameter, also known as vasoconstriction. All right, let's go ahead and get into the dosing. Intravenous or intravenous, intravenous, that's an interesting way to say it. <laughs> intravenous um, administration for hypotension, you know, you're looking at 40 to 60 mics a minute and up to 100 to 180 mics a minute or you can dose it at a 0.05 to one mic per kilo per minute. Now you can also give this medication IV push, but full disclosure, this is only really done in anesthesia. So if you're listening to this and you're in the ICU, please do not do that. <laughs> um, but if you're in uh, anesthesia school and you're listening to this as a current anesthesia resident, this is for you. So again, IV push, um, the dose per kilo is five to 20 mics per kilo with the range being anywhere from 40 to 200 mics being the most common. I will say practicing both in adults and in pediatrics, that in the pediatric world that you most commonly see this diluted down to 40 mics per, where in the adult world, you're going to see it diluted down to 100 mics per. And again, practicing open heart for several years, you want to just give you want to titrate to effect, meaning you don't just want to whack someone with 200 mics of Neo or 400 mics or anything like that. You want to just work it in slowly, see how they react and then titrate accordingly. So again, everyone's going to react slightly different. You want to make sure you understand how sensitive your patient is to this medication. All right. That kind of sums up this episode, but of course I saved some trivia and some facts for the end that we will go ahead and get into. Well, hello, future CRNA, another daily dose of inspiration along your CRNA journey. This success story starts with, I just wanted to post this as a reminder that you can get into CRNA school even with a low GPA. I would always see people posting their stats with a high GPA, community service, every certification, asking if they had a shot at school and feel so discouraged about my own application. I got into school with my first degree GPA of a 2.98 with C's in most of my science classes and completely failing out after my freshman year. My nursing GPA was just a 3.4. I never really took any classes, only microbiology, general chemistry as prerequisites for nursing school since I had a previous C's. My science GPA is still probably way under a 3.0. The only certification I have is a CCRN. I have nothing special under my belt like committees or community service. I was just flat out honest with my grades and my interview and emphasized my passion and dedication to becoming a CRNA in my personal statements. I hope this was helpful for someone because I know how it feels to see all the stats people post and feel that you will never make it because you don't have a perfect competitive GPA. You can do it. I just love this so much. Um, you know, thank you, you know who you are for sharing this because this really truly does give so many hope. And hope is a powerful, powerful thing. If you have hope, you have belief. If you have belief, you take action. So thank you so much for sharing this. You do not have to be perfect. You know, the road to CRNA, while it's going to be full of ups and downs, and yes, with these kind of statistics, you may face rejection. More than likely you will. But that should be the expectation, and then you should try to find ways to grow and spread your reach. Try out different programs. You know, you never know unless you try. And, you know, this student gave themselves a chance, even though they weren't sure if they'd make it. And I guess I wanted to also point this out because recently we, we launched a CRNA guarantee program, which I'm so thrilled about. But you guys, it was really hard to pick students. And I saw so much in all these students and I wanted to accept every single one. But we, we couldn't. We couldn't do that. And I, I've said it, but I want to say it again, especially if you're listening to this podcast and that was that was you. I believe in you. I really, really believe in you. And I hope you believe in yourself to give yourself the gift of trying. So with that, I'll leave you guys something to ponder and let's get back into the show. Okay. So your patient is on a monoamine oxidase, 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 <laughs> however you say it, inhibitor for depression and suddenly develops hypotension. What agent might be appropriate for treating hypotension? And then what agents should you avoid? So let's go ahead and start with what you should avoid. 
You want to avoid ephedrine and any other indirect acting agents, and you actually want to use phenylephrine, which is a direct acting symp sympathomimetic to treat hypotension. The reason for this is because indirect acting agents can actually cause uh, significant hypertension. So you want to be careful with using those uh, indirect acting agents. All right, next trivia question. During the case, the patient becomes hypotensive. How should this be treated? Treatment should be directed at correcting the underlying cause and may include the following. So you want to consider decreasing your anesthetic depth. You want to consider giving fluids. You want to consider placing the head or the patient in uh, Trendelenburg, which is head down. You also want to consider giving a vasopressor such as phenylephrine. And if there's no obvious cause, the, the thing that I would recommend the most is just decreasing the depth of anesthesia. Now, keep in mind, the reason why I even put this one in here is because I don't want you to assume that just because the blood pressure is low that you want to jump straight to vasopressors. That's not always the case. You, and you want to make sure that again, you're treating the cause and not giving them something that's not necessary when you're causing it by having them, maybe you left your gas up and you forgot about it, for example, or maybe you just dose them with some pain medication. So you kind of expect to see you know, a dip in blood pressure, but maybe they're getting ready to make an incision on the field. So you don't want to treat treat low blood pressure when they're getting ready to cut them with a knife, which that in itself would spike the blood pressure. So again, you have to really assess the situation, understand where you're at in the case, what the surgeon's actually doing. There are some times that the surgeon's actively causing the hypotension by, you know, putting, you know, pressure on the IVC, for example. So again, when the surgeon's causing the hypotension, maybe you could tolerate it, but maybe you can communicate with the surgeon if it becomes intolerable and they need to let up so you can, the patient can recover. If that's not possible, or if it's during a, if, if it's a critical part in the case that just is to be expected and needs to happen, you're going to have to support the patient as best as possible to get through that point in the case. So again, I want to put this in here because I, I don't want you to jump straight to vasopressors. As soon as your patient becomes hypotensive, you really have to assess the situation and what's going on and get a full picture of how to treat it. All right, next, I want you to identify the anesthetic concerns. If say you have like an obese patient taking any of these drugs, a sympathomimetic amine and a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor or an SSRI. These drugs can often be used to suppress appetite. So you will sometimes find that these types of patients, um, bariatric patients are on these medications, especially if they are gearing up for, um, you know, um, something like a Roux and Y procedure where they have to lose weight prior. So just something to keep an eye on. These drugs um, it may actually produce hypotension, tachycardia, anxiety, psychosis, and catecholamine depletion. This is a big one. They, they can produce catecholamine depletion. So catecholamine de depletion can lead to profound hypotension during induction or maintenance of anesthesia, which is refractory to indirect acting vasopressors such as ephedrine. So in this situation, you want to use phenylephrine, which is a direct acting. It's usually effective in reversing low blood pressure. All right, next is you have phenylephrine, also known as neosinephrine or NEO, which stimulates what receptors? And then also describe the cardiovascular action of phenylephrine. Phenylephrine activates alpha-1 adrenergic receptors and phenylephrine produces a greater vasoveno constriction, veno constriction than arterial constriction, resulting in elevated blood pressure due to both an increase in SVR and an increase in venous return you have a reflux decrease in heart rate and cardiac output. All right, the reason I'm gonna go into the next one is because we briefly mentioned the reflux decrease in heart rate and I want to explain it in a little more detail. It doesn't have to do with neos, particularly neosinephrine, but I wanted to, again, um, describe the baroreceptor reflux. All right, so the baro, baroreceptor mediated reflux is a physiological response triggered by the activation of baroreceptors which are specialized stretch receptor receptors <laughs> located in large arteries like the carotid and aorta, which are considered high pressure baroreceptors and in the heart and lungs, which are low pressure or low volume baroreceptors. 
high pressure baroreceptors monitor blood pressure at rest and during the cardiac cycle, while low blood pressure baroreceptors detect changes in blood volume and the degree of stretch in the ventricles and atria, as well as the dynamics of lung inflation and deflation. When you inflate your lungs, you decrease preload. When you deflate your lungs, you increase preload. It's all because of the pressure. Changes such as hypotension, low blood pressure, and hypovolemia, low blood volume, lead to decreased activation of these baroreceptors. Additionally, some cardiopulmonary vagal afferents, which if you recall, ferrets take things to, so they take signals to your CNS. Um, they act as chemoreceptors and can trigger a cardiovascular response that interact with baroreflex mechanisms, influencing heart rate, blood vessel constriction, and overall cardiovascular stability. All right, that sums this up. And I'm going to give you a bonus in your PDF notes, which are again listed below. So go ahead and grab those. The bonus in the PDF is going to explain how chemoreceptors work. So go ahead and grab your copy now. Again, chemoreceptors have really, again, didn't really have uh, relevance for this lecture, but I thought it was interesting and definitely something that you will have to study in CRNA school. So you are welcome. I hope you enjoy. And I hope you guys loved this series, this little mini vasopressor series. If you would like more of this type of content, just let me know. Shoot us an email at hello at CRNA School Prep Academy. We would love to hear from you. And of course, we appreciate any reviews you leave for the podcast. It really helps us. So thank you for the time that you take to do so. And until next time, take care. Hey, future CRNA, as always, I appreciate you and your loyalty. Thank you so very much for tuning in this week. I'd love to hear from you. So screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories with your biggest takeaway. Don't forget to tag me at CRNA School Prep Academy so I can personally thank you. Be sure to head over to CRNAschoolPrepAcademy.com to check out our blog and gather free resources to help you along your CRNA journey. Stay strong and I'll see you next week.